So the joint probability between two random variables x and y can be computed using the Parson uh, window method. In this case, uh, in our context where we're comparing two patches of f and g, what this simply means is the joint probability over the two random variables denoted by x that represents the vector of f and y that denotes the vector of g will be given by this equation over here. Let me give you an illustration in a one-dimensional uh, case. So suppose that um, we have a kernel where k here is equals to a, a 2D kernel in this context, and uh, it's usually a 2D Gaussian. Suppose that uh, we have a 1D kernel, uh, which is also denoted by k. This means that we only have one random variable uh, using the Parson window approach. So this is equivalent to estimating the kernel uh, density function. And you know, 1D case, this kernel over here is defined over the values of x, where for every value in the vector of f, I'm going to subtract it with uh, all values of x. And what this means is that for each value in f, I'm defining a Gaussian kernel over the range of all the uh, possible range of x over here. And this uh, is simply for one particular entry in the uh, 9 by 1 vector of f that we have defined for over a 3 by 3 window. So note that the uh, this can be of any size. It need not necessarily be just uh, 3 by 3. It can be 5 by 5, 10 by 10, uh, etc. But uh, in this particular context, I'm going to just illustrate it with a 3 by 3 uh, kernel. And what this means is that for every value, I'll get a Gaussian kernel where sigma is a predefined uh, value which we define as a hyperparameter and uh, as a result we will get nine of these Gaussian kernels and we know that because each entries in the vector of f it corresponds to the 3x3 three three patch in the image and since they are nearby pixels the image intensity might be quite similar to each other so uh, we might end up with a result where the kernel, some of them might be overlapping uh, or very close to each other and by taking a sum over all the nine kernels, what we are doing here is that it's essentially equivalent to um, modeling the superposition of these nine kernels into a distribution. It might look something like this. And this would be the uh, distribution that we have for the 1D example over X. And for the 2D example, of course, we are looking at a, a two-dimensional where we have X and Y, for example. And then what we are looking at would be the joint distribution, which uh, will appear to each one of this uh, value of uh, corresponding value of F and G. Uh, it will correspond to a 2D Gaussian kernel. So we have uh, many of this in total because uh, in the 3x3 three three example, where we have nine entries per vector over here, we have a combination of uh, nine by nine uh, kernels and where the joint probability would be simply the superposition of all these Gaussian kernels. So in a discrete context, uh, what this means is that uh, we would have a two-dimensional table that represents this uh, joint probability. This means that I would have uh, a two-dimensional table where every entry here uh, represents a single uh, probability. Suppose that this guy over here represents x equals to 1, and this guy over here represents y equals to 1. So that means that the entry in here would be equivalent to px equals to 1 and y equals to 1, the joint probability of this. And of course, this would be y equals to 2, 3, and all the way until uh, the the specific range of the uh, where x and y can Thick. And uh, we can is, uh, essentially compute this entry by fixing x here equals to 1, for example, and y here equals to 1. And then we will sum it over all the possible entries uh, and putting it into the Gaussian kernel to get the value of px equals to 1 and y equals to 1 over here. So we'll do this repeatedly for all the combinations of x and y over the possible range of uh, x and y and to, to get this particular joint probability or discrete uh, v value of the joint probability of x and y. 
So once we have obtained the joint probability of x and y in a discrete form, which was uh, illustrated earlier on as a two-dimensional uh, table that represents the joint probability of x and y, where each axis uh, represents the value of uh, x and y respectively, we can then obtain the marginal probability of x and y by simply summing up over the uh, values. So suppose that uh, we have the probability of uh, joint probability, which is represented by this table over here. The marginal probability of x would be simply given by the sum over all the possible values of uh, y uh, in this joint probability table. So what this means is that uh, for, we'll, for probability of x, it will be a one-dimensional uh, table that looks like this. This would be my marginal probability of x. And every entry here would be simply equivalent to the sum over every each row of the joint probability uh, table. And similarly, for the marginal probability of y, this would be equivalent to the submission over all possible of values of x uh, over the joint probability. And this is also a one-dimensional uh, probability, which we denote by p of y over here. And every entry here would be the sum over every single element in a column of the joint probability uh, table. After computing this, uh, we can then put into the mutual probability uh, function that is given by this equation over here and uh, to get the photoconsistency measure as defined earlier on in this particular slide. Here's an example of the different matching costs over these two uh, images that is shown here. So suppose that I'm interested in the value of this particular pixel over this uh, particular scanline over here. So suppose that uh, I have already uh, rectified this particular image. So this scan line would be uh, into a horizontal scan line and where this is a rectified image. So for every patch over here in this particular scan line, I'm going to compare the matching cost with this particular image patch over here. And then I'm going to plot out the matching cost over the inverse depth. This means that I'm going to take the disparity and uh, compute the depth, which we'll see how to do this in the next few slides. And uh, we can see that there is a certain minimal value for the SSD, the sum of square uh, difference, where the lowest value here would be the one that we take as the depth for this particular uh, image pixel over here. And uh, what this essentially means is that we are scanning it over the whole scan line. And then we are taking the pixel, which is visually more similar to this particular reference patch. And, uh, and this is essentially given by the value uh, with the lowest matching cost and uh, the, which corresponds to this particular uh, point over here uh, example that is uh, uh, given. The, so the that would be uh, somewhere corresponding to 0 0.5. We can see that uh, for SAD, it's uh, the minima, the, this global minima is also pretty obvious, but probably not as obvious as uh, the sum of square difference. And normalized cost correlation, we will be looking at the uh, maxima. And since in this particular example over here, there's a high rep repetitive feature. That means that the texture is actually repeated all over the place. Uh, as we have mentioned earlier on that uh, this is a highly repetitive image. It's not good for our uh, normalized cross-correlation computation. So we can see that uh, the maximum point over here, it's somehow not very distinctive compared to other points. We have all these points. So this means that it could easily confuse uh, the computation of the depth if we were to use the normalized cross correlation method in a highly repetitive uh, structure like this. So, uh, and the last example over here would be the cost given by the mutual information. We can see that this seems to be the perfect uh, way to compute the uh, cost for this highly repetitive uh, image because it's making use of the probabilistic. Uh, formulation where a very clear global minima can be identified here. Now, once we have obtained the disparity from the matching cost, so uh, earlier on we say that if we have a reference image and a, a second image over here, for each patch over here, I'm going to compare uh, the cross correlation over a scan line. 
suppose that this uh, the one with the best matching cost uh, in terms of the correlation. So what I'm going to do here is that next is that I'm going to take uh, the x value minus of the x prime value over here. And this would be called my uh, disparity. So I'm not now going to show that this particular disparity value that I can obtain directly from the uh, patch matches uh, over here to get the depth of the point. So because we know the rotation and translation and after rectification, uh, we, we say that the epipoles are to uh, it gets maps into at the point at infinity and uh, the epipolar line now becomes uh, equal that they becomes the same scan line so we'll show in this step that uh, once we have identified the disparity we can directly uh, compute the 3d point or the depth of this particular 3d point with respect to the reference frame without doing triangulation at all so uh, here's an illustration suppose that x and x prime uh, it's the x value of the corresponding patch that we have found from the uh, image correlation step, uh, as mentioned earlier on. So we can see that uh, the distance of the image plane to the camera center uh, all over here, it's given by the focal length. Uh, suppose that two of the images have, having the same focal length, which we can easily do this by taking the inverse uh, normalize camera coordinates uh, using the camera uh, matrix over here. So at this step, we can assume that uh, they have the same focal length. And we can see that if we were to draw a line joining the camera center, the image point, and the 3D point that give rise to this uh, image point, as well as to draw another line with the that joins the 3D point, the image correspondence in the other image, as and the camera center of the other camera. We can see that by the virtue of similar triangle, we have the similar we have a triangle here. We also have a bigger triangle here. So we can compare these two as a similar triangle uh, by taking the ratio of x over f uh, to be equal to be uh, to be equals to b1 divided by z, which is the depth of the uh, 3D point. And we can do a similar uh, operation on the other camera where we take the ratio of uh, minus x because this is defined in the opposite direction of the uh, frame. Uh, and we can take this as minus x prime divided by x, which is the focal length. This is the triangle over here. This would be a similar triangle to this guy over here. So we can uh, do the similar operation by taking b2 divided by z where b1 and b2 the, uh, adds out to be the baseline this means that uh, this is equivalent to the translation after rectification uh, recall that there's only a translation in the x direction uh, between the two camera centers which we denote as b over here and that's simply the sum of uh, b1 and uh, b2 so we can see that uh, by the this particular relation uh, of these two relations that are obtained from the similar triangle we can take a sum over both sides of the equations to get this so we'll get x minus x prime divided by f since they are the same f over the two equations and as well as b1 plus b2 divided by z z can be uh, because it's the same denominator so there's only one z over here and we can rearrange this by bringing f uh, up onto the uh, right hand side of the equation so we'll get uh, b1 plus b2 multiplied by f where we will uh, bring this up and since we have defined earlier on that b1 plus b2 is equals to b which is the baseline of the uh, two camera centers so we can uh, rewrite this b1 plus b2 as simply the baseline which is equivalent to a scalar value of the translation uh, vector in the x direction between o and o prime multiply by f divided by z where z here is the depth this guy here is uh, the depth of the 3d point so rearranging this this means that we can get the depth equals to b multiplied by f divided by x minus x prime and x minus x prime over here is the disparity that we can find from the matching uh, cost and now so what this means is that since b here and f here is given by the calibration of the stereo setup oh, once we have found the disparity map of every pixel 
which is simply given by the difference between the x-coordinates of the refer of that pixel in the reference image and its corresponding uh, pixel in the other image. We can directly compute uh, z, which is the depth of the 3D point from this relation over here. And what's interesting here is that uh, z is actually inversely proportional to the disparity. So this means that uh, the larger the disparity, the smaller the depth value is going to be. And here, similarly, if uh, x prime is going to be seen in the the other side of the uh, camera, we can uh, similarly define uh, using the similar triangle relation, these two relations over here. And because in this case here, uh, we are going to overshoot uh, B by having uh, this relation over here as B2, and the whole uh, base over here would be B1. So the similar triangle here that we are considering would be first this triangle and this particular triangle, which is the base over here to give us this equation here. And then the next triangle that the next set of similar triangle that we are going to consider is this triangle and as well as this particular triangle over here to get this relation. So combining the two, we need to subtract this time because we want B1 minus B2 to give us B, which is uh, what we know from the camera calibration. So we can take X minus X prime divided by F equals to B1 minus B2 divided by Z over here. And uh, we can see that here, uh, by doing the same operation, we can bring this up here to become F multiplied by B1 minus B2. And B1 minus B2 here is simply uh, the baseline, uh, which is the a scalar value that is the, denotes the translation along the X axis. We can again get the same relation where X minus X prime equals to B uh, multiplied by F over Z, where Z here is the depth. So we can uh, bring the depth up and uh, become Z is inversely proportional to X minus X prime. And uh, here we can also see that the reason why uh, we, that I mentioned earlier on that given a pixel on the reference image, which we denote as X, the search for the other uh, image correspondence cannot be exceeding the value of x. So x prime has to be in this range. Uh, if I have, if I superimpose this, that means that I take this coordinate and draw it here. So the range of x prime must be within this particular range. It cannot fall beyond this range over here. And the reason is pretty simple because uh, here we can see that x minus x prime must always be more than zero because since the baseline is always going to be more than zero and focal length is always going to be more than zero as well. So uh, in order for the depth to appear in front of the camera, this means that Z must have the value of more than zero. Hence, X minus X prime must be more than zero. What this means is that if we were to find a correspondence of X prime in this range over here, then this simply means that the 3D point is appearing behind the camera. And uh, from the relation earlier on, we can see that uh, Z, which is the depth, is inversely proportional to the disparity. So if we were to plot the disparity, the smaller the disparity, the larger the distance is uh, going to be. And what it also means is that a small disparity, it, the measurement would become more inaccurate and more sensitive to error because a small perturbation here will essentially lead to a large difference in the uh, distance. And this means that there is a certain useful range uh, of the stereo camera. For example, for the Bumblebee camera that we have uh, looked at, uh, the useful range is usually up to a range of 10 to 11 meters. So what we have looked at so far is a naive way of uh, doing matching to compute the disparity map. And this naive way is known as the block matching, where we consider every pixel independently by scanning across the respective scan line on the other image to look for the visually most similar corresponding patch to get the disparity map. And what happened here is that uh, since we are considering every pixel, the search of every pixel independently, this means that we will uh, likely we are likely to end up with a blocky 
uh, that map that looks something like this, where this is a, an example of the input image, uh, in, of the left image, and this is the ground truth that map. We'll see that uh, we end up with a lot of this uh, noisy holes in between the block matching where we use a 3x3 three three kernel. And uh, what happens here is that if we were to uh, do a small window, a uh, smaller window, uh, we will end up with a of a size 3, for example, in this particular example over here, we'll end up with what we mentioned earlier on about a very blocky disparity map. So, however, there'll be more detail over here. So the, the boundaries of the tree trunk over here, for example, can be clearly seen in the that map. Uh, we can resolve the blocky uh, issue by using a larger window. Since we are still considering every pixel independently, so this will end up with an over smoothing uh, effect where we can see that the fine grain detail of the original image can no longer be seen in our disparity map. So there is also uh, uh, some possible failure of the correspondence search as we have mentioned earlier on. Suppose uh, one of the example would be a textureless uh, surface. Suppose that I'm looking at the image patch at this particular location over here and the corresponding scan line is this line over here. So you can see that the patches along the background which is the wall over here, they look very similar and it's uh, there's no texture at all. So this means that the matching cost that we will get for this whole range and this whole range over here would be the same. So this means that uh, we can't differentiate between the best and the second best or even the subsequent uh, matches along this particular scan line. Another problem which we have looked at earlier on is the repetitions on occlusion. So this means that uh, this particular uh, patch over here, since we are looking over this particular scan line, it might get matched to this or this over here or this over here. So the cost of this would be uh, quite similar. So it's not possible to differentiate. Uh, in, in other words, the cost function that we saw, uh, we might have multiple peaks, for example, in this case over here. So uh, it becomes indistinguishable between these uh, three peaks over here because they are too self-similar. And another example of the failure would be the non-lambertian surfaces. So non-lambertian surfaces means that surfaces uh, which are specular, this means that it reflects off light. For example, uh, on a car surface, you can see that it's very shiny and uh, these are all non-lambertian surfaces uh, or glasses that uh, covers this particular uh, photo frame. And any uh, when we take a snapshot of this, it might reflect light, and uh, hence the matches along this epipolar line or the scan line might not be uh, good enough. We can see very smudgy effect that looks something like this after we have obtained the depth map. And uh, in order to resolve this, we can use uh, what is called the scan line optimization uh, stereo because we know that pixel wise computation we are treating every pixel uh, independently but we know two neighboring pixels in an image they don't occur as a neighbor for no reason they occur as a neighbor because they are indeed uh, similar they are indeed lying close by in the 3d uh, scene so what we want here is that we want the computation of the disparity or the search over a scan line to be uh, to take the neighbors the the depth of the neighbors into account of neighboring pixels into account instead of considering every one of this uh, pixel independently so a good constraint here for neighboring pixel would be to make the assumption that uh, because we know that two neighboring pixels as i mentioned earlier on they don't appear as neighbors for no reason they should be lying on the same surface over the same object. In other words, the depth difference between these two pixels should be very minor in the real uh, 3D world. So what we can do uh, here in the optimization of the disparity map would be to add a, what we call the smoothness constraint along each scan line. So this means that neighboring pixels, we want it to, as much as possible, take the same disparity value. And since we know that the disparity 
uh, value is given by x minus x prime, where x here is actually the entry of a pixel in the image. So this means that I'm taking a discrete value of x because we know that an image is made up of a constellation of uh, pixels where every entry in the pixels is indexed by a integer number. So this means that the possible set of all the disparity by taking x minus x prime would be a finite set of integer values. So this is a finite set of integer value and uh, which we can denote it as d of p, which is the disparity for the particular uh, pixel p over here. This means that uh, since it takes a finite set of entries over here, we can rewrite this into 1 uh, to l, where l would be the whole range of uh, all the possible entries in our disparity value over here. So each one of these represents a discrete difference of x and x prime. And we can now to find the problem to find the disparity map as a labeling problem. So this means that uh, for the reference image over here, for every pixel, we are going to sign a label of one out of the L labels in all the possible uh, disparity map over here. So we'll do this for every pixel. And what we also want to do would be to uh, consider all the disparity within a bound. This means because just now I mentioned that uh, for a certain value of x over here, we want to, uh, the, the set of labels, we want to consider all the possible uh, difference. But we know that uh, there's only a bound. That means that uh, we cannot have infinite depth because uh, the difference here is not going to take anything outside the image. For example, x prime is not going to take a value that is outside the image. So this is, means that the disparity would be a finite set. And we wish to even uh, string this set further by considering only a disparity that is within a certain range because we also know that from this relation over here the smaller the disparity the larger the uncertainty so we want to bound it at a certain uh, range and uh, hence we will say that uh, we want to bound x minus x tilde where x tilde is the possible set of uh, x prime in the second image to be within a certain range of uh, alpha so the whole uh, operation to label for every pixel one out of the l labels in the disparity uh, space so can be formulated by the following cost function we will have a unary cost over here as well as the binary cost so this binary cost is equivalent to a smoothness uh, cost function where we used to regularize the constraint that or the prior knowledge that we have that two pixels appear as two neighboring pixels because they have to have a, a quite consistent uh, depth value. So uh, this can be written as the uh, cost of uh, d p d uh, subscript p over here. So this is the similar dissimilarity measure uh, because we want to minimize this particular cost. So uh, what this means is we want p to take a depth or to take a disparity value such that the cost over here is minimized as much as possible. What this means is that this is simply our matching cost between the two image. So suppose that I'm looking at the pixel p over here. What I'm interested in is that for the, the other image over here, I'm looking for the patch over here that gives me the best matching cost which will uh, minimize this particular uh, value over here and as well as uh, i want to in in addition to looking at just the unary potential over here uh, which is in the case of our uh, block matching so if we do block matching we are simply just looking at this term the unary cost over here but now in addition to this because we also know the prior that neighboring pixels must uh, take the are uh, encouraged to take the uh, similar depth we want to add this regularization uh, potential over here, which is uh, what we call the uh, uh, pairwise or potential, or uh, it could be a pairwise or binary potential or higher order potential, it doesn't matter. So depending on the size of uh, N over here, Q, 
uh, takes a neighboring pixel. So if uh, we will look at one scan line, so what this means is that for P, we'll consider along this particular scan line all the neighbors, which we call Q, uh, or all the neighbors that are in N. So this whole set of neighboring uh, pixel, every one of these is denoted by Q. We want the disparity to be as smooth as possible. That means that DP and DQ, the disparity of this P and Q, it should be as close to each other as possible. So depending on the size we consider, the easiest way to do this would be just simply to consider a pixel in the left and a pixel to the right of the image. Uh, but we'll look at the first scenario where uh, all the neighboring pixels still lie on the same scan line. And here we can define this uh, regularization cost as uh, this uh, function over here, where we say that if uh, dp and dq, uh, which means that the disparity are equal, then we'll give a zero cost. We want this cost to be as small as possible. This because we want to minimize, we want to minimize this particular cost value over here. So what it, this means is that in addition to making sure that we get the best uh, similarity or the best matching cost over here, we also want the DP to take a label such that it is the same as the label of its neighboring pixel DQ that is defined by this guy over here. And uh, if they are not the same, so uh, if they are uh, in a difference of uh, by a magnitude of one, then we'll give it a value of, uh, we'll give it a penalty, the cost of uh, P1. So if it has a larger disparity, this uh, a larger difference, this means that uh, within a neighboring pixel P and Q over here, if the depth of DP and DQ are too dissimilar, uh, larger, way larger than one, then we want to give it a, a heavier penalty. Hence, P2 must be bigger than uh, P1 over here. So now this, since the neighboring pixels lies on the same scan line, the neighboring, uh, what we can do here is that uh, it turns out that the way to optimize this is uh, uh, can be done using the dynamic programming or otherwise is known as the V2B uh, algorithm to do this uh, optimization. So we can think of it in this particular way. Uh, we, if we look at a single scan line, so this block over here is obtained from a single scan line, this particular block that corresponds to a single scan line in the left image, in the left image over here. And then uh, this particular block over here, it's obtained from the same scan line, a block of the image in the same scan line on the right image over here. So if we were to compute for every pixel here, Suppose that uh, I write this particular pixel as P, I compute every pixel, the disparity or the, the matching cost of this particular pixel, uh, which means that this particular patch over here with respect to all the patches that I see in the right scan line over here. And the cost of this, the matching cost would be uh, every entry in the row of this particular similarity matrix. What this means is that this similarity matrix will give us all the disparity cost for every pixel on the scan line in the left image with the uh, right scan line with a sliding window across the right scan line. So uh, in the case where we look at a uh, block matching, which is the case where we only consider the disparity value over here, what we are doing here is that every pixel in the scan line over here, we are looking for the minimal cost. For example, this could be the minimal cost for this particular pixel. And then the uh, for the subsequent pixel, which we call Q, for example, we're looking for another minimal cost, which might be here. But what is happening there in the block matching case is that this two disparity, because uh, having a match over here for P, pixel P, means that since this corresponds to X prime over here, and this corresponds to X over here, means that there's a certain disparity value for dp over here. And in this case for q, there's also a x value and an x prime value for the uh, entry over here. So the depth, this means that there's a certain depth of dq. And if there are two of these, 
since they are neighboring pixel on the same scan line, but the disparity over here, they are very far apart. This means that the two disparities are very uh, dissimilar, which is not what we want because we say that uh, we know that we are enforcing this prior uh, that two neighboring pixels must have uh, that value that is as smooth as possible. That means that they must be as similar as possible. Hence, we want to give it a, a higher penalty over here. So what this essentially turns out to be would be starting from the first image pixel over here on the left scan line and the last image pixel over here, the right scan line, uh, on, on the left scan line as well, we want to find the shortest path that leads from the start of this particular scan line to the end of the scan line. And uh, what I meant by shortest path is that for every entry that is in the way of this particular path, I want to sum out all the values. And for each transition, from one entry to another entry over here, for example, uh, in this particular uh, illustration that I've shown here between P and Q, uh, I'm exaggerating the illustration uh, uh, by a lot. Uh, suppose that P and Q are just uh, the neighboring pixel in this particular scan line over here. So uh, if I were to choose it, the next value of DP to be as close as possible in this particular pathway from the start to the end. So two pixels over here, what I'm saying here is that two pixels. What I want to do is that I want to select them to be as close as possible. And this would mean that the disparity uh, penalty to be uh, very small. So I want to end up with a situation where I have one pixel over here and the other cost would be the other uh, value of Q which is the neighboring pixel would be as far as possible. So I want to avoid this. This means that uh, as a result, what I'm interested in, it would be to find the lowest or the shortest path from the start to the end. Considering all the entries, all the values of the entries that uh, the, the path passes, as well as the edges that links every pair of entries that the path passes through. Since we mentioned that we are going to only consider uh, a disparity value within a certain uh, range of uh, alpha or threshold of alpha, what this means is that I'm going to ignore uh, this part of the of the similarity matrix in my search of the uh, path. So uh, as a result, what we will get here is that uh, there are certain few examples of the possible paths from the start to the end, and we'll choose the one which ends up to have the uh, lowest cost, then that would be the solution to this particular uh, optimization function over here. So an uh, example of this is that uh, of the disparity map obtained from this method is given here. So since we are still only considering uh, scan line, now at least it's better than the first case where consider individual pixel. Now instead of considering individual pixel, we are considering the neighboring relation between all the pixels within that particular scan line. But uh, what happens here is that we are still ignoring the relation between the different scan lines. So as a result, instead of getting the blocky uh, artifacts that we have seen earlier on, we'll get this streaking artifact over here where we can see that uh, over a single scan line is probably uh, very consistent. You can see the depth over here is very consistent. but when we look at different scan line across the rows, across the different rows, we can see uh, this continuity, which means that there's a certain jump over the different scan line. And what we'll get here is that something like this, which is known as the streaking effect. And we can probably do better by uh, simply considering Q to be uh, anywhere in the in the particular image. So this means that we want a smoothness over all directions uh, in the particular image. So suppose that we are considering uh, pixel P over here. We want to consider Q instead of just lying along the straight line to have a same disparity. We'll consider every uh, other neighbors in all possible direction. So in the most extreme case, we want this P over here to be consistent with all the other pixels, all the other cues in the whole image. And this is known as global matching. But unfortunately, by doing so, we tend to have a better result in this particular case. But because we are considering the neighboring pixels of all 
uh, uh, possible pixels in the that particular image. What happens here is that uh, we will end up with a on MP complete problem, which is intractable to uh, solve. Uh, most of the time. And um, although there's a method to do this, which we call the alpha expansion, it's a special case of the of a graph cut, uh, but this is out of scope in this particular uh, module. We will not further consider this. If you are interested, you should take my class uh, next semester in the modeling of uh, uncertainty in AI, where I will talk about this in more detail.